Slava Sutta Christu. Today we celebrate the Sunday of the Holy Fathers of the first six ecumenical councils. That is a particularly Slavic way of looking at these early councils. In the Mediterranean part of the Eastern Churches, they celebrate the first four of these councils and on a different Sunday. Nonetheless, today's feast seems rather unusual to our modern sensibilities. It makes little sense at all until we listen to the words of the Troparion, which proclaims the Council Fathers as illuminaries on earth guiding us and all things to the true faith. The Contakion continues in a similar vein. The Apostles preaching and the Fathers teaching confirmed the Church in a single faith. So that nails the issue, unity of faith. The early teaching of the Church is a developmental thing. It's not just handed to the Apostles as a blueprint by Jesus Christ. No, it develops through synodal and conciliar structures which are still with us in this day and age. By this means our Christian faith grows. There is an interesting passage in explanation of all this to be found in the Acts of the Fifth Council, that is the Second Council of Constantinople, which was held in 553. The actor records this. The Holy Fathers dealt with heresies and current problems by debate in common. Since it was established as certain that when the disputed question is set out by each side in communal discussions, the light of truth drives out the shadows of lying. That is a very forceful way of establishing that it is discussion and debate which is to determine these things. The Council goes on. The truth cannot be made clear in any other way when there are debates about questions of faith since everyone requires the assistance of his neighbour. Hence the importance of discussion and consent within the church. We still have that situation today. It is not by an authoritarian edict, but rather by discussion that the church finds its way. And so these early councils, these six that we mark today, may be listed for our purposes. The first two councils, the first council of Nicaea in 325 and the first council of Constantinople in 381 resolved a good deal of the Arian controversy regarding the nature of Jesus Christ in relation to God the Father. Was Jesus Christ, Son of God, the second person of the Trinity in our kind of language? The Nicene Creed, of course, emerged from these two councils, the creed that we recite every time we celebrate the Divine Liturgy. 
In 431 there was the Council of Ephesus which defended Mary as Theotokos or God-bearer, thus laying the foundations of Christian devotion to Mary and in doing so emphasised the divinity of Jesus the Christ. Then at Chalcedon in 431 there was the assertion of Christ's humanity. There is always a balancing act that goes on in these developments. First one side of the argument, then the other side of the argument. The following two councils were held at Constantinople, the second council of Constantinople, and the third extended the work of Chalcedon by exploring further the relation between the humanity and the divinity of Christ. We could say that by then the doctrine of the Trinity was clearly established. Of course councils usually of a local nature have continued to be held in the churches both of the East and the West. The conciliar method has been used where church unity has been at stake. The conciliar method has had a huge role in the establishment and development of the Ukrainian church. And so we may say it is an irony that the Roman Catholic Church has held historic councils from the med medieval period onwards. There are three significant councils of the modern period and they are the Council of Trent in the 16th century, the First Vatican Council in 1869 and the Second Vatican Council in the 60s. What is the irony? The irony is that more than 50 years after the last of these councils there is still struggle over the acceptance of its teaching and most especially over its methodology of collegiality. The argument is not yet settled in many ways as we know when we look at the struggles going on between Pope Francis and some of the cardinals of these, of these days. Perhaps that's the reason why we have the reading of the Gospel chosen for today. It's a long prayer, the final prayer of Jesus. As a prayer, it comes across like a meditation on the Otche Nash. It takes the Lord's Prayer and extends it. Jesus prays for himself because he is about to return to his Father. But he also prays for his disciples who here on earth have the mission of continuing the teaching of Jesus. I hope you were able to join in that prayer as the bishop and the deacon read it for you. Essentially it's a prayer for the unity of the church, the unity which we need so very much in today's world. Slava Sousa Crystal.